I um I started beekeeping last year. Um, and the beekeepers of the Albemarle has been a wealth of knowledge and help to me. So I just want to give them a, a, a little plug right here. Uh, if anyone is interested in becoming a beekeeper or just learning more, uh, the club meets the third Tuesday of every month at Corinth Baptist Church <clears throat> starting at seven o'clock. Um, before I get started, I just want to talk a little bit about the honeybee, uh, also known as Apis mellifera. Uh, when you talk about a honeybee colony, you have three types of bees. You have the queen. Her sole job is to lay eggs for the colony and, and provide young bees to replace the older and dying bees. Um, you have the workers, which are the bees that do everything else. They raise young, they forage for honey, pollen, they take care of the queen, they clean up, they build comb, they clean up the comb. Um, they remove dead bees and fight off insects and wasps and anything else that might want to invade the hive. Uh, and then you have the drones. And this is the only male bee. And his only job is to mate with the queen and then die. Um, so you can insert your joke here as you wish. Uh, um, several things that the bees are really good at. The main one, and I think the one that everybody loves the most, is honey production. Um, they're renowned for their role in producing honey. They collect nectar from flowers and transform it into honey through a process of regurgitation and enzymatic activity. A uh, fun fact about bees is they actually have two stomachs, one for themselves to digest the honey and the foods that they, they need. And then they also have a separate stomach to collect nectar that is actually for the honey making. Um, so, you know, honey serves as a valuable food food source for bees and humans have been harvesting honey for thousands of years as natural sweetener, uh, various ingredients in cooking, and then also some medicinal applications. Uh, they also produce beeswax as a natural substance secreted by worker bees from special glands on their abdomen. Beeswax is used by bees to construct honeycomb cells where they store honey, raise brood, and store pollen. And humans also utilize this bee wax in various products. I'm sure you've seen candles, cosmetics, skincare, furniture polish. Um, it has many, many beneficial properties. They also produce propolis, which is also known as bee glue. Uh, they collect this resin from trees and mix it with wax, pollens, and enzymes to produce this sticky substance we call propolis. Uh, they use it to seal cracks in the hive, strengthen its structure, and protect against pathogens. Uh, propolis has also been used in traditional medicine and is gaining recognition for its potential health benefits in human application. Uh, pollen collection is uh, bees collect you know pollen from flowers as a protein source for their brood. Uh, while pollen is not a direct hive product, it does play a crucial role in bee nutrition and the development of healthy colonies. Pollen collection by bees also indirectly benefits plants through pollination. Uh, pollination is their main source of protein uh, required for raising brood and baby bees and keeping the queen healthy. Uh, then we also have royal jelly, which is a nutrient-rich secretion used to feed and nurture young larvae and the queen for life. The queen gets royal jelly her entire life. Um, it's rich in proteins, vitamins, and hormones, and is also highly valued for potential health benefits and can also be used in various dietary supplements and cosmetic products. Um, so, so let's get right into it. Uh, bees and pollination. Bees are a very important pollinator. Um, they are one of the most efficient that we have. Um, they are very crucial in food production. You know, uh, pollination is essential for agricultural productivity. Many crops such as fruits and vegetables, nuts and oil seeds rely on insect or animal pollinators to ensure high yields and quality. Uh, pollination services by honeybees contribute to a significant portion of the global food production, making it crucial for food security and human well-being. It's also crucial for the production of seeds. Obviously seeds are essential for plant reproduction. Um, Fertilization occurs when this pollen reaches the female reproductive organs of a flower, initiating the development of seeds. Seeds serve as the basis for the next generations of plants, generation of plants. Um, without seeds, no more plants. Without bees, 
no more seeds. Also in fruit formation, uh, in many flowering plants, successful pollination leads to the formation of fruits. Fruits play a vital role in dispersing seeds and ensuring the survival of plant species. They provide nourishment and protection to seeds and their attractive colors and flavors entice animals to consume them, aiding in seed dispersal. Uh, pollination also enables genetic diversity. The transfer of pollen between different plants leads to genetic diversity within plant population and enhances their ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions and increase their overall resilience. Uh, also, pollination is a key process in maintaining biodiversity. By facilitating the, rep the reproduction of a wide variety of plant species, pollination supports diverse ecosystems and provides habitats and food sources for numerous animals, including insects, birds, and mammals. Um, again, we talked about it being one of the primary pollinators in nature. Uh, the bee is highly efficient as a pollinator. Uh, some bees have co-evolved with flowering plants that, and developed specialized adaptation that make them highly efficient pollinators. The bee itself is built to be a pollinator. They have hairy bodies that trap and carry pollen as they move from flower to flower, increasing the likelihood of, of successful pollination. Uh, bees exhibit a dedicated foraging behavior. Their whole existence as a worker bee is to actively seek out flowers for nectar and pollen. Uh, and while they connect nectar as a food source, they inadvertently transfer pollen between flowers, facilitating cross-pollination and fertilization. So bees have a very long flight range, um, capable of flying long distances, allowing them to access diverse plant population and forage over extensive areas. This broad foraging range increases their effectiveness as they connect fragmented habitats and promote genetic exchange among plant populations. The foraging area for a beehive is generally accepted to be around two miles, but bees have been known to fly far beyond this in search, far beyond this in search of food. Uh, some re research has shown that as long as there's a food source within four miles of a hive, the population will increase. Obviously, the shorter the flight, the better, as the bees will avoid wasting energy traveling long distances whenever they can. Um, so many plant species have evolved specific relationship, relationships with particular bee species, uh, depending on them for successful reproduction. Some bees have co-evolved with these plants, developing specialized traits that align with specific floral characteristics and pollination mechanisms of these plant species. Um, as bees are incredibly abundant and diverse with over 20,000 known species worldwide, their sheer numbers and variety make them highly effective pollinators across a wide range of ecosystems, including forests, meadows, and agricultural landscapes. So unfortunately, we have to talk about the decline of bee populations. Um, there are several factors that I'm going to touch on just a handful today. Um, one of the major factors is pesticide use. Um, the widespread use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides has been linked to bee population decline. These chemicals can directly harm bees by affecting their nervous systems, impairing their foraging, and navigation abilities and weakening their immune systems. Um, and obviously we live in a farming community. Uh, a lot of these pesticides are in use around the area. Um, and it's, it's a difficult decision, right? We have a population to feed, but we also wanna protect those insects, specifically honeybees that uh, make that pollination possible to allow those crops to grow, to feed the population. So it's a fine line we walk. We also have habitat loss and fragmentation. The conversion of natural habitats into agricultural land, urban areas, and industrial zones leads to the loss and fragmentation of bee habitats, limiting the availability of diverse foraging and nesting sites, therefore reducing the bee populations. Um, you know, we, we call it progress. We wanna pave the planet, but at the same time, we are reducing bee populations by eliminating their forage and nesting sites. Um, then we talk about varroa mites and other diseases. 
Uh, the varroa mite, also known as the varroa destructor, are a parasitic mite that infest bees and uh, can transmit viruses, bacteria, and fungi. These pests weaken colonies and make them more susceptible to disease, such as a de deformed wing virus and American fowl brood, among others, thus contributing to bee population decline. <clears throat> if you look at the top right picture there, you'll see the little varroa mite on the honeybee. Um, and to give you some reference uh, to the honeybee, that would be like having a parasite the size of your fist attached to you. So, and they feed on the bee blood, which is just under the, the exoskeleton of the bee. Um, this is the bane of almost every beekeeper's existence that I know. It's a constant struggle to maintain var varroa mite levels at a low enough level to keep your bees healthy. Um, advancements are being made, but it's, it's just a constant struggle. Uh, then we also have, oh, and also I have this, this is a, what's called an easy check. It's, uh, it's a testing kit for, for varroa mites. You fill it with bees, uh, you fill it with rubbing alcohol and shake it up. The bees, the varroa mites collect on the bottom and you can do a count to see how bad of a varroa mite inspection, infection you may have. Um, it, it's, Pretty much a foregone conclusion that any beehive or colony is going to have varroa mite at some point in their existence. Um, it's just unavoidable right now. And we also have to talk about climate change, changing climate patterns, including extreme weather events and shifting flowering and nesting se seasons can disrupt the synchronized timing between bees and their floral resources and can lead to mismatches in the availability of food sources and reduced reproductive success negatively impacting depopulation. And then we touched on this a little bit, the uh, intensive agriculture practices. So when you have large scale monoculture farming where vast areas are planted with a single crop, it reduces the diversity of flowering plants available for bees. And moreover, the use of agricultural practices like tilling, irrigation, and synthetic fertilizers can further degrade bee habitats and decrease the availability of food resources. <clears throat> so the impact of declining bee populations. First one is pollination, being one of the primary pollinators for a wide variety of plants, including many crop crops that are essential for global food production. Declining bee populations can result in decreased pollination rates, leading to lower crop yields and reduced biodiversity. This impact on pollination can disrupt entire ecosystems, affecting both wild plant populations and agricultural systems. Uh, on food security, approximately 75% of the world's food crops depend to some extent on pollination by bees and other insects, meaning that one in about every three bites of food is thanks to a pollinator uh, and most likely a honeybee. Um, as they decline, the diversity of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds may be compromised. This can ultimately affect global food security, leading to increased food prices and potential nutritional deficiencies in human populations. Um, then we also have ecosystem disruption. You know, bees playing a, cru a crucial role in maintaining the balance and functioning of ecosystems. By pollinating plants, they contribute to the reproduction of flowering plants, which serve as food sources for other animals, including insects, birds, and mammals. Reduced bee populations can disrupt these interconnected relationships, potentially leading to cascading effects throughout the entire ecosystem. And then we have to talk about habitat loss, factors such as intensive agriculture, urbanization, pesticide use, and climate change all can tribute to the loss and degradation of bee habitats. This includes wildflower meadows, forests, and hedgerows. As bees lose their natural habitats, their populations decline, exacerbating the negative effects on ecosystems and agriculture. And we have to talk about the negative economic consequences as well. Uh, the decline of these bee populations can have significant economic consequences. Beyond the direct impact on crop yields and food prices, it can also affect industries such as honey production, beekeeping, and the pollination services provided by commercial beekeepers. These industries contribute billions of dollars to the global economy and their decline can result in job losses and reduced economic growth and sustainability. 
So let's talk about beekeeping. I mean, what is beekeeping? The most basic, it's the maintenance of bee colonies, typically in hives by humans. Um, and when you talk to some beekeepers or you hear people talking about beekeeping, they'll use the term colony and hive interchangeably. And typically that's fine, uh, but there's a little st distinction there. The colony is the actual bees. The hive is the wooden box that, or sometimes plastic, that the bees live in. Um, so a beehive contains a bee colony, technically speaking. Um, and it's also important to note that practices vary based on beekeeper preferences, regional factors, and ongoing research. You can ask three beekeepers the same question and you'll get six different answers. Um, so let's talk about some of the ancient origins. Uh, beekeeping has a rich historical significance with evidence of its practice dating back thousands of years. Ancient civilizations such as the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans recognized the value of bees and their honey, documenting their beekeeping techniques and incorporating religious rituals and medicinal practices. Honey was also found in King Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt dating back 3,000 years, but the oldest honey known to us was found in the Caucasus deep in the Republic of Georgia and is said to be 5,500 years old. Uh, beekeeping has also played a crucial role in cultural and economic development of many societies throughout history. Honey and beeswax were highly valued commodities used for food, trade, and the production of various goods such as candles, cosmetics, and even early forms of medicine that we already talked about. Um, as essential pollinators, uh, bees have had a huge and continue to have a huge agricultural in, in impact uh, beekeeping has had a profound impact on the agriculture by facilitating the pollination of crops. Beekeeping has increased crop yields and improved food production. This significance continues to be relevant today as bees and other pollinators contribute to the sustainability of our modern, modern food systems. Also, bees and beekeeping have held symbolic and mytho mythological significance in various cultures. Bees have been associated with fertility, industry, harmony, and social organization. Ancient civilizations often depicted bees and beehives in art and mythology, showcasing their importance in the collective imagination of humanity. <clears throat> in recent times, beekeeping has also gained renewed historical significance due to concerns about declining bee populations and the overall health of ecosystems. Beekeepers, scientists, and conservationists have emphasized the need to protect bees and their habitats, recognizing their vital role in maintaining biodiversity and ecosystem balance. We have uh, a wealth of modern beekeeping practices. Um, there have been hive design and management innovation over the years. Uh, advances in these design and management techniques have greatly improved beekeeping practices Modern hives are designed to prioritize bee health and natural behaviors, which with features such as removable frames for easier inspection, ventilation systems for temperature control, and integrated pest management mechanisms. Additionally, hive management tools like beekeeping apps and remote monitoring systems help beekeepers monitor hive conditions more effectively. So we have uh, three different types of hives up here. Um, to me, this is the most common that I've seen so far in my short beekeeping career. Um, the most common is this middle one. It's the square hive that you'll likely see wherever bees are being kept. It's called the Langstroth hive and was invented by Reverend Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth. And he received a patent on October 5th in 1852 for the first movable frame beehive in America. Now, uh, one of the key points of his design is he figured out the bee spacing in the hive to, to give them the proper living quarters, so to speak, but then also allow for honey production and to keep the, the bees comb where you want it, more or less. Um, now, the bottom one is likely the oldest beekeeping hive in existence, and it's called a skep hive. Uh, the bee skep is a traditional hive that reigned supreme for thousands of years until it got superseded by the Langstroth hive. Uh, 
Bee skips were very popular and man-made, used to harvest honey and beeswax. Um, it's a bottomless dome-shaped basket and it's painstakingly handmade by what were called skeppers. Um, I don't know anyone who uses this anymore because, unless it's just for historical purposes, because in order to harvest the honey, you have to kill the column. Um, so that is not what we are trying to do as beekeepers. Um, and then on the top right there is what's called a Kenyan top bar hive. Um, the Kenyan top bar hive is a trough shaped hive that originated in Kenya under the direction of a Canadian bee researcher, Dr. Maurice Smith, and sponsored by the Canadian International Development Agency under a, a four year project that began in 1971. So the top bar hive is literally what it sounds like. These are the top bars that hang across the top of the trough there, and the bees build their comb on the bottom of these bars. Um, now, this one was begun with a, a package that I put into the hive, and, and they decided they didn't like it, so they left. But they managed to build this for me before they left. Um, but when you see one of these frames fully built out, it'll be from end to end and as deep as the trough is. Um, there are some variations in this type of hive. I've seen people call it a long lang trough, where it's just a long box, but they use the bars. Um, this hive is to be a little bit more natural environment for the bees and that it doesn't have the frames that the bees build their wax on. Uh, they build it naturally how they would in the wild uh, on these bars. Now, there is uh, some beekeepers do it locally or on a corporate scale. Of, um, they do queen rearing and bee breeding. Uh, this is when you engage in selecting bees for specific um, traits. It could be um, honey production, gentleness, disease resistance. And uh, invo this involves identifying those traits and then raising queens from those colonies in order to create newer qualities, uh, colonies with those qualities. Um, then we have, we want to talk about the integrated pest management. Uh, beekeepers employ integrated pest management strategies to control and mitigate the impact of pests and diseases on bee colonies. Uh, and this focuses on a combination of cultural, biological, and chemical control methods when necessary to maintain a healthy and balanced bee population while minimizing the use of synthetic pesticides. And this goes back to the Varroa mite we talked about um, specifically. It's, it's a seasonal thing. Uh, I know personally I treat for them in the spring and the fall because if you don't, they can get out of control real quick. And it'll do a, a colony in, in a matter of months if you don't watch it. Um, and we also like to uh, incorporate sustainable beekeeping practices, emphasizing these practices that prioritize the well being of both the bees and the environment. And this includes avoiding the overuse of antibiotics, minimizing hive disturbance during inspections, providing diverse forage sources for bees and adopting hive designs that promote natural behaviors and reduce stress on the colonies. <laughs> now there's been quite an advance in technical, technological uh, beekeeping practices. Um, it includes the use of hive monitoring systems that track temperature, humidity, and hive weight to assess colony health and productivity. Additionally, advanced beekeeping tools and equipment such as honey, honey extractors and protective clothing have involved, evolved to improve efficiency and safety in managing bee colonies. So what are some of the benefits of bees and beekeeping for pollination? First one for me, honey. Who doesn't love honey? Well, I can't say that. I know some people that don't, but... Uh, so the bees' natural characteristics, behavior, and specialized adaptations make them highly effective and efficient pollinators. Uh, their important role in pollination contributes to the reproduction of numerous plant species, supporting ecosystems, and sustaining global food production. Uh, bees are some of the most efficient pollinators that we have. Uh, their unique biological characteristics um, 
make that possible. They have the specialized body structures we talked about with the branch hairs and the pollen baskets on their hind legs, which actually allows them to collect and transport large amounts of pollen from one flower to the other. Um, and I think on this top one here, you can kind of see it a little bit on the back there. Um, they, uh, uh, they exhibit a, a behavior called floral constancy, which means they tend to visit flowers of the same species during a foraging trip. Uh, this type of behavior increases the chances of successful pollination by ensuring that pollen from one flower is transferred to another of the same species, enhancing fertilization and the fruit or seed production of that plant. Um, they also exhibit frequency of visits, <laughs> which means they are frequent visitors to flowers, making multiple trips between their nest and forage sites in a single day. This frequent visitation increases the opportunities for pollen transfer, incre increasing the likelihood, likelihood of successful pollination and fruit setting. So bees are, are really known for their loyalty to a particular foraging site. Um, they often return to the same location and flower patches repeatedly. This type of behavior increases their efficiency as pollinators since they become familiar with the floral resources, reducing the time needed to locate and extract the nectar and pollen. Uh, and then there's also buzz pollination. So some plants are what we call self-pollinating, <clears throat> like a tomato, blueberry, eggplant. Um, and the bees facilitate this uh, primarily by vibrating their muscles as they're visiting each little flower. Uh, and this helps to release the pollen from the flower's anthers, enhancing the efficiency and pollen transfer for this type of fertilization. Um, importance of bees for the re reproduction of wild plants and ecosystems. Um, it cannot be overstated. Their role in pollination supports biodiversity, creates habitats, sustains food webs, enhances ecosystem resilience, and contributes to the overall functioning and balance of natural environments. Um, some of these we've talked about before, but it's a theme that I tried to put through this, this presentation to drive home some of these aspects. Uh, the biodiversity maintenance, again, they're crucial for the reproduction of numerous wild plant species, trees, shrubs, and flowering plants. Uh, they facilitate pollination that contributes to the production of seeds, fruits, and nuts again, which are essential for the regeneration and dispersal of plant populations. And this helps maintain the biodiversity in these ecosystems and support the survival of various plant species. Uh, they play a significant role in habitat creation um, and ecological succession. Many wild plant species rely on these bees as their primary pollinators and their activities contribute to the establishment and growth of plant communities. The presence of diverse plant communities in turn provides habitats for a wide range of other organi organisms, such as insects, birds, and small mammals. Uh, they, like we've talked about before, contribute to the functioning of food webs. As primary pollinators, they ensure the production of these fruits and seeds and nuts. Uh, the loss of these bees and subsequent decline in pollination will disrupt these food webs, leading to negative impacts on wildlife populations and ecological balance. Uh, when we talk about ecosystem resilience, honeybees enhance the resilience of ecosystems by promoting genetic diversity among plant populations. Uh, through cross-pollination, bees facilitate the ex exchange of genetic material between individuals and populations, leading to increased variation. This genetic diversity allows plants to adapt and respond to environmental changes, making these ecosystems more resilient to disruptions such as climate change or habitat loss. And lastly, soil fertility and succession. Bees can indirectly contribute to soil fertility and ecological succession. The pollination of wild plants by bees leads to the production of seeds that can germinate and establish new populations. And these plants in turn help to stabilize the soil, improve nutrient cycling and support the colonization of other plant species. The presence of diverse plant communities facilitated by bees contributes to the long-term health and productivity of these ecosystems. The roles play a big, big uh, bees. Bees play a big role in food production. 
um, some uh, of the bee pollinated crops that came to mind for me were apples, almonds, blueberries, cherries, cotton, uh, cotton specifically because I live in the middle of about 500 acres of cottons every summer. And uh, so I see how it helps my bees produce honey and uh, I'm thankful for that. Um, but when we talk about crop diversity, the bees play a vital role in pollinating a wide range of crops as we talked about already. Um, many of these fruits and vegetables are dependent on bee pollination for successful reproduction and high yields. Um, Often, bee-pollinated crops are highly nutritious, providing essential vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Examples like apples, oranges, berries, and melons, as well as vegetables like cucumbers, tomatoes, and pumpkins, all um, benefit from the pollination of honeybees. Um, also, bee-pollinated crops have a significant economic value. The pollination services provided by bees contribute to the production of high-quality crops increasing their market value and profitability for farmers and agricultural industries. And on top of that, bee pollination is crucial for the production of seeds and many crops, uh, which we already talked about, serve as the foundation for the next generation of these plants and uh, ensuring the availability of planting materials for substance, subsequent growing seasons. Now, there are some indirect benefits. The bee pollinated crops provide ecosystems and wildlife, the abundance of flowers and nectar rich plants in agricultural landscapes and support a diverse array of pollinators, including bees, butterflies, ladybugs, other beneficial insects as well. Uh, this in turn helps maintain the biodiversity and eco ecological balance. And uh, while bees are essential for the pollination of numerous crops, it's also important to acknowledge the other pollinators such as butterflies, moths, birds, and bats, who also contribute to the pollination of various crops and wild plant species. A diverse community of pollinators is necessary for a robust and sustainable pollination service in agricultural systems, and the honeybee is a crucial member of this community. So there are some economic impacts of bee pollination. Um, we talked about increased crop yields already. Uh, bee pollination significantly enhances crop yields for many commodities. Some studies have shown that bee pollinated crops can experience yield increases ranging from 20 to 70 percent compared to crops that rely on other forms of pollination or are self-pollinated. Um, bee pollination also contributes to improved crop quality, including attributes such as size, shape, color, and flavor. Proper pollination ensures uniformity and desirable characteristics, making the produce more appealing to consumers and commanding higher prices in the marketplace. Uh, many high value crops such as almonds, blueberries, cherries, and watermelons depend heavily on bee pollination. The economic value of these crops is closely tied to the availability and effectiveness of bee pollination services as it directly influences their yield, quality, and marketability. Um, the reliance on bee pollination and agriculture also creates employment opportunities and income for beekeepers, farmers, and farm workers. Beekeepers provide pollination services by renting out their managed honeybee colonies to farmers, contributing to their livelihoods and the overall agricultural economy. Uh, I know specifically in California that that is a big business for the almond trees. Um, beekeepers to bring in tractor trailers full of beehives, uh, specifically to pollinate the almond trees. Um, so then we also have the economic impact of bee pollination extending beyond the agriculture sector. The availability of diverse and high quality, high quality bee pollinated crops support downstream industries such as food processing, manufacturing, retail, Additionally, beekeeping and honey production create additional reven revenue streams and job opportunities within the food industry. So it's also important to recognize the economic impact of bee pollination extending beyond monetary value. Bees and other pollinators contribute to the overall resilience and sustainability of agricultural systems, helping to ensure food security and the availability of a diverse and nutritious food supply. 
So what are some of the environmental benefits of beekeeping? So beekeeping practices often involve creating and maintaining suitable habitats for bees. Beekeepers provide beehives with shelter, food sources, and protection from predators and adverse weather condi conditions. By doing so, so, they contribute to the conservation and restoration of natural habitats. Bee-friendly practices, such as planting wildflowers, preserving green spaces, and reducing pesticide use not only benefit bees, but also support the conservation of other pollinators, wildlife, and overall ecological integrity. In this way, beekeeping plays a role in protecting and enhancing environmental habitats. So creating and maintaining bee-friendly habitats involves planting diverse ranging flowering plants that provide a continuous and abundant source of nectar and pollen throughout the seasons. This ensures that the bees have access to nutritious food and helps to sustain their populations. Uh, avoiding pesticide use is a big one. Minimizing or eliminating the use of pesticides, especially, and I'm gonna try to get this right, neonicotinoids, and other systemic insecticides is crucial for bee conservation. Pesticides, pesticides can and do have harmful effects, on, harmful effects on bees, including direct mortality and sublethal impacts on their behavior, reproduction, or immune systems. Adopting organic and integrated pest management practices helps protect bees and their habitats. I know that uh, after becoming a beekeeper, I stopped using seven uh, across the board. My go-to now is neem oil. And even with the neem oil, I try to only uh, apply it early in the morning before the bees get out or late in the evening after they've tucked themselves away for the night. I have also turned to uh, using marigolds, basil, uh, nasturtium, any other flowering plants that are natural insect repellents, just trying to reduce any type of pesticide in my, my garden. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to practice what, what I'm preaching here. Um, so also you can provide nesting sites and shelter for bees, which is essential for their survival. This can involve leaving patches of bare ground, providing bee hotels or nesting boxes, preserving dead wood or hollow stems, and ensuring the availability of suiting nest, suitable nesting materials. Uh, these measures these measures encourage the nesting and reproduction of bees and support their habitat requirements. Uh, water sources, um, like almost every single living thing on this planet, bees need water. Access to clean and fresh water is vital, um, including water features such as shallow bowls or small ponds and a bee-friendly habitat can provide bees with a reliable source of water, particularly during hot and dry periods. Um, <clears throat> I know for me, last year being my first year, I didn't have a suitable water source. So they made my chicken waters their water source. Uh, so it was quite an interesting uh, feat to go into my chicken coop to be swarming around to change out their food and waterers. So this year I've tried to give them something else to drink from. Um, but if you're gonna put out a water source for a bee or a bee colony, you have to make sure that there are rocks or some other type of structure that they can land on. If you just put out a kiddie pool full of water, they're gonna to fly to it and drown. Um, and also uh, beekeeping promotes awareness and education about the importance of bees and their conservation. Uh, encouraging individuals, communities, farmers, and landowners to adopt bee-friendly practices, such as creating pollinator-friendly gardens, participating in citizen science initiatives and supporting local beekeepers helps foster a culture of conservation and sustainable land management. So it's important to remember that bee friendly practices not only benefit bees, but also contribute to the overall conservation of pollinators, biodiversity and ecosystem health. By creating and preserving bee-friendly habitats, we support a wide range of wildlife to support these ecosystems and promote sustainable land use practices. So let's talk a little bit about those sustainable practices. Uh, Pollinator-friendly landscaping. Beekeeping promotes the adoption of pollinator-friendly landscaping practices. 
As beekeepers, we often encourage the planting of native flowers, herbs, and trees that provide abundant nectar and pollination for bees. These practices contribute to the creation of habitat corridors and support the health and diversity of pollinator populations. We'll talk about it again, reduced pesticide use. <clears throat> As beekeepers, we are often, if not always, advocates for reducing or eliminating the use of harmful, pe harmful pesticides. These pesticides can have detrimental effects on bee health and contribute to pollinator decline. By promoting alternative pest management strategies, such as the integrated pest management and organic farming practices, beekeeping fosters sustainable agriculture and reduces chemical impacts on the environment. In addition, beekeeping emphasizes the importance of conserving natural resources. Beekeepers often implement water management practices such as rainwater harvesting or providing water resources for bees to minimize water waste and support for water conservation efforts. These practices contribute to the overall sustainable use of natural resources. Um, as beekeepers, we also encourage the adoption of waste reduction and recycling practices. Uh, we utilize materials such as beeswax, honeycomb, and propolis, which are renewable and biodegradable. Additionally, recycling and re reusing hive equipment such as frames, bees, and boxes. <laughs> Reduces, reduces waste and promotes a circular economy mindset. <clears throat> and if you, after we're done, you want to come up and look, you'll see that a lot of this stuff is reused and has to be propolis and, and residual wax and things of that nature. Um, and again, uh, beekeeping serves as an educational platform to raise awareness about the importance of uh, environmental conservation. Uh, beekeepers often engage in educational activities, workshops, public demonstrations, and school programs to educate communities about the roles of bees in the ecosystem and the impacts and environmental factors on bee health. These efforts contribute, contribute to fostering environmental awareness and inspiring individuals to take action for a more sustainable future. So how can we support bee populations and beekeeping? Uh, you can plant a bee-friendly garden. Planting a variety of native plants and flowers in your garden provides abundant nectar and pollen sources for bees. Choose plants that bloom at different times of the, throughout the year to provide a continuous food source for the bees. Again, avoid chemical pesticides. Minimize or eliminate the use of chemical pesticides in your garden as they are harmful to bees and other pollinators. Opt for organic pest control methods or integrated pest management strategies to protect your plants without negatively impacting bee populations. Um, you can provide shelter and nesting sites and create a suitable habitat for bees by including features such as bee houses, nesting blocks, or just undisturbed areas with bare soil and natural debris where bees can nest and lay their eggs. I mean, I'm focused on the honeybee today, but different bee species have varying nesting preferences. And so providing a variety of options to accommodate very, uh, various bee species is helpful as well. And we talked about water sources. They require water for hydration. You can provide a shallow water feature, such as a bird bath or a shallow container with stones or floating objects for bees to land on and access the water without the risk of drowning. And I know this last one is big for me, reducing the lawn area, because every time I get on the mower, I want it to be less grass for me to cut. Um, so <laughs> you can definitely minimize the size of your lawn and replace it with bee-friendly plants and flowers. Um, lawns provide limited resources for bees, uh, while a diverse landscape with flowering plants offers an abundance of forage and habitat. Consider converting parts of your lawn into a wildflower meadow or creating pollinator-friendly pollinator garden beds. Um, and so if you can't, if you, you don't have the room or, or even want to plant a friendly garden, um, there's a link up here to the uh, North Carolina Beekeepers Association, and they are trying to um, set up an endowed professor professorship at North Carolina State University. Um, <clears throat> if you feel so inclined, you can follow that link and, and donate. Um, so they're trying to get a permanent professor uh, for their apiary and beekeeping at the school there. Um, and you can also support local beekeepers and their products. Um, I do know that there are several 
businesses across the area from Elizabeth City to Manio to South Mills um, that sell honey. I don't know if any of them sell beeswax, but you can always find uh, a beekeeper online um, that'll sell you beeswax, or you can contact the beekeepers of the Albemarle. They'll point you in the right direction. <laughs> um, but I do know that Harbor Pharmacy on Main Street has honey, um, Meads Town Produce, uh, Planners Ridge out on Harvey Point Road. If anybody's interested, I have a list of some, some spots here you can visit if you'd like. Um, so just to kind of recap the importance of bees and their role in pollination. Um, we talked about fruit, food production, quality, and security, um, the efficiency, behavior, and diversity of the bees and how it relates to pollination, habitat creation, ecosystem resilience, and soil fertility, and the economic impact as well. Um, so what it boils down to is bees play a vital role in pollination, which is crucial for the reproduction of flowering plants and the maintenance of biodiversity. Their importance extends far beyond honey production as they are responsible for pollinating approximately 75% of our food crops and numerous wild plant species. Through the process of pollination, bees transfer pollen from the male parts of the flowers to the female parts, enabling fertilization and the production of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. This process enhances crop yields, improves the quality of agricultural products, and ensures food security for human populations. Additionally, bees contribute to the reproduction of wild plants, supporting the growth and diverse plant populations, and maintaining the balance of ecosystems. The decline of bee populations poses a significant threat to global agriculture, biodiversity, and overall ecosystem health. It is crucial that we raise awareness about the importance of bees, promote sustainable practices, and provide suitable habitats for bees to thrive and continue their essential, essential role in pollination. By supporting bee populations and preserving their habitats, we can safeguard our food supply, promote biodiversity, and maintain the health and resilience of our ecosystems. Um, and then I just like to use this last bullet as a call to action and just encourage everyone to support bees and beekeeping um, for a sustainable future. It can be something as simple as not using that pesticide you've always used or picking up a lo local jar of honey or, uh, and I would really like to um, reiterate, you can uh, donate to the professorship they're setting up at NCSU in North Carolina State University. Um, so that's it. I appreciate everyone coming out this afternoon. I have some equipment here. If you'd like to come check it out, ask questions. Um, I'll be happy to give you any information I have. And if I don't have it, I can try and find out for you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Paul. This is uh, Bonnie Mitchell from the North Carolina Coastal Federation. And I just um, I just wanted to check and see about um, carpenter bees. Um, I've always heard that they're, they're included. So there in are several products um, on the market for controlling varroa mites. Um, some are, are natural, some are chemical based. Um, depending on, I guess, the size of a beekeeper's apiary, meaning how many colonies do they have, um, <clears throat> different methods are used. Um, there, the method I use is there's a product called thymol, and it's actually made from the thyme plant. Um, and it just comes in a little disc and you just set it right on top of the, the frames here. And as the bees go about their cleaning maintenance in the hives, they spread it to the other bees and it kills the varroa mites. There are uh, more harsh chemicals. There's even a, a type of vaporizer, it's called oxalic acid. Um, and you basically fumigate the whole hive. That's very effective, but it also has a slight impact on the bees. It doesn't kill the bee, but it, it kind of sets them back a little bit. So yes, there are methods and, and products on the market to control the varroa mite, um, but they are just, they are, are, they're very prevalent. And, and if you don't keep an eye on it, they'll, they'll take your colony out pretty quickly. 
And China would be cheaper than it used to strangle and dash your sugar in her eyes and said that these clean each other and go off the road. Hmm. I don't know that much. I don't know that much. Um, I have not heard of that, but I do know that, so this, this Varroa mite test kit is used with rubbing alcohol, and the consequence of that is it kills the bees. But the thought behind it is if you, if your hive can't take a loss of, you know, a cup full of bees, then that hive might be doomed already. Um, but now there is a technique where people use that powdered sugar shake it up and then the powdered sugar cooks the bees and you can see the, vero the varroa might stand out on the bees. And as you shake it, they also fall into the bottom off of the bees. So, but I don't have to look into that. I do know that they will clean each other when they get coated with something like that. Was the thing of organic honey? Organic honey? Depends on who you ask. Um, I, I believe federal government has, or the state even may have guidelines that consider organic honey. Um, my product, I don't call it organic because I don't, I haven't even looked into adhering to those guidelines. I just call it natural honey as opposed to organic. Yeah, are there these containers you see also? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> The bees I have are from a local beekeeper and they have been bred to be calm. Uh, the first package I got were, I believe, Russian honeybees, I wanna say. They are very aggressive. So aggressive that I had to move it out of my backyard all the way to the back of the property because I couldn't even garden some days without them coming after me. Um, I can't answer that question directly. Uh, I do know that each hive is different. You could get three queens from the same batch of queen rearing. This hive could be very calm. This hive could be very aggressive. And the third could be somewhere in between. So I don't, I don't know specifically on which strain the bees are more docile. I do know where to get gentle bees, and so that's what I'm doing going forward. Good question. Um, I suffer from allergies, and I was told that if you buy a local honey, it helps with those allergies. But what is the radius of buying local honey that's going to benefit you from those allergies? Right. So there is there is some truth in that. Um, the main thing being is as long as your allergies or you suffer or you are allergic to those plants and flowers that the bees are collecting that pollen and nectar from, taking that honey should help you. But if you have an allergy to say, what, pine tree, pine pollen, the local honey is not really gonna help you because they're, they're not collecting pollen from pine trees. Um, and when you talk about a radius, um, I mean, if you have, a, a local beekeeper within a mile of your home, you're definitely getting about the, as local honey as you're going to find. Hmm. Question, sir. Um, how do you know how much honey to extract from the take from the bees for your personal use versus what's to leave them in an area called sourwood? I have not heard of the sourwood honey. I'm going to look that up. Asheville. Asheville? Okay. Um, as far as harvesting honey, uh, as a general rule, well, so let's talk about that. The bees make honey to eat. They store the honey to have it through the winter because in the dead of winter in February, you know, January, February, there's not much flowering out there. So they go to their stores and eat them up. Um, for me, I use, so this is called a bee, let me just into a brood box or a super. A brood box has eggs, larvae, um, so I stack three of these high, and that's my three box. Anything above that, so a fourth, fifth, even sixth, I'll take the honey. Um, the the key is to leave them enough through the winter, so you don't have to end up feeding them sugar water, or you can get synthetic pollen patties. And while that'll sustain them, it's not the, the best for them. So for me, anything above that third medium, I'll take. 
I live up, up on the north side of windmills. Mm -hmm. um, there's aerial spray constantly there. Uh, is there any protection or how do you work with that? Or can you work with that? You can. The, the best. The best policy is to know your local farmer. Um, probably for me, I, and I haven't flushed this out all the way, but within a mile radius of your house to know your farmer and just work with them. You can, there are lists um, that you can sign up for with the state that uh, provide your names to farmers as well. Uh, I know there's one website called Bee Watch. Um, it's a voluntary website. So I've signed up there and registered my hives on that. <clears throat> but the best thing you can do is just have a farmer and have, have a relationship and say, hey, let me know when you're gonna spray. And you can do things like block the entrance so the bees can't get out that day, cover it with a sheet or a tarp, cover your hives so the bees, um, they might get out, but it might, you know, keep them in because when the sun rises, they're like, oh, it's daytime, it's time to fly. So if you keep it dark or you just block it up all together so they can't get out when the spraying is happening, um, that's one way. Um, I've heard of beekeepers uh, <clears throat> putting um, like a sprinkler on their hives because if it's raining, the bees don't want to fly. Uh, the main thing is just knowing your farmers, having them contact you when they plan on spraying and cover them up or, or, or lock them in the hive. Uh, that can be problematic, though, because if it's super hot out in the middle of August and it's 95 degrees, the last thing you want to do is plug up all the ventilation on your hives. So it's a give and take. And the one guy used a pop of 10 by 10 uh, canopy with a mesh around it, mm -hmm. and he covered his hives and that, so they were able to get out and they stay in that one area. And still get the ventilation. Get ventilation. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to have to look into that. Anyone else? Uh, just one question on Zoom asking if carpenter bees provide a benefit or a degradation. Uh, depends. Um, we have carpenter bees all in my deck, and they can be invasive and they can do some damage and compromise the structure if left unchecked. But from what I've read, the carpenter bee, while not as abundant in nature, uh, is a more efficient pollinator than the honeybee. They visit more flowers per day than the honeybee, um, but it can be invasive. There are tactics that you can use to get rid of them. You can get traps. Um, you can outright kill them. I don't suggest that, but it just depends on your disposition towards them. Thank you so much for your talk. Really right. enjoyed it. Thank you all for coming to it. Thanks, everyone.